Let's talk about the data bricks. What it is and how it's different from the databases like a Snowflake or BigQuery. And in order to understand it, I will first use a whiteboard to talk about some basics and then we will log into the Databricks to see how it looks like and how it works. Before we jump on it, please, please hit the like button and if you are interested in the Databricks or, or data engineering in general, it might be a good idea to subscribe because there is a plenty of new cool content coming shortly. Databricks is built on the software which is called Apache Spark. Spark. This is open source software and the same people who have created it have started the whole company Databricks. Well, good for them, now they are super rich. So you can think about the Databricks as Apache Spark in the cloud plus multiple different additional features if you pay for it you get more. So the question is why this Apache Spark or the Databricks is so attractive for the companies and so many users? Well, there's probably a plethora of reasons, but I want to talk about two main things, two main things. So two main reasons why Databricks is so successful. And the reason number one is something, what, I, what I'm going to show you later on how it looks like in the real world. It's a separation of storage in CPU. What does it mean? When you are loading data into, into Databricks, you are not loading data to some database. All your data are being stored in the files, files which are in the open source format called Parquet and more data you load, more data you create or bigger file you create. Ultimately, no matter, no matter how many data, how much data you are going to load, everything will be stored in the files, meaning you are going to pay for it like you would pay for storage. And storage nowadays is really, really cheap. That's the first wonderful thing. You are going to pay more only when you want to analyze data, transform data, when you want to build machine learning algorithms or visualize data. That's when you need a CPU. And in order to, need to have a CPU, you need to create something what is called cluster. And cluster, let's call it C1, is a set of one or more virtual machines, VM, and let's say two virtual machines in the cluster, VM2. And depends on your need, you can analyze or process, basically process the data. Now, if you are, if you are not in hurry, but you are a cost aware, you don't care if something will take five minutes or two hours, you may want to create very small cluster with very affordable one virtual machine, let's call it C2, just like that. On the other hand, if you are a startup or the corporate building Jab GPT type of machine learning algorithm, then you may want to, then you may need a fat, a bit more expensive cluster, like let's call it C3, which will cost more, but you will get a virtual machine with the GPUs, with Plendora of RAM, and whatever else you will need. You are controlling the cost and you are controlling the capabilities the Databricks is delivering to you. And that's the first thing. The second thing is that Databricks is truly all in one, all in one platform. For many years, depends on your role, data science, data engineers, you would be using completely different tools because there were tools specialized for your job. A synchronization of your work, the synchronization between the teams would be really, really difficult. In Databricks, the primary interface which you are using to interact with Spark cluster is something what is called Notebook. Notebook. Depends on your preference and depends on what, you, what are your roles and your tasks, you may choose a language and the way you are interacting with Spark cluster. If you are a data analyst, you may decide and you have the possibility to use SQL. If you are a data engineer or data scientist, you may choose and uh, interact with the Spark cluster with Python. Or maybe you are building some, some other application, you may choose to interact with Scala. That's the flexibility which is being delivered to the end users, making them really feel comfortable using one platform and makes it very easy for them to collaborate with each other. And at the end, Databricks is fitting the gap which was existing for many, many years of having one data platform in the company. We can log into the Databricks in all main free clouds, GCP, AWS and Azure. We will do that in Azure like most of the people, so I just click sign in. If you don't have an account, it's pretty straightforward to create and you get 200 bucks for a start. 
And then I type, of course, Databricks, Azure Databricks, here it is. And the first thing we need to do, we need to create something that is called Workspace. Workspace, it's our place where we will write the codes, where we will create the clusters and where we will basically perform our analytics. And just a few basic information, subscription, in my case, Azure Basic, resource group, if you don't have one yet, then you can create new, workspace name, whatever, it's just for the purpose of that movie, and region, usually you just select the one which is the closest to you, although US is cheaper than Europe, so it's up to you. Pricing tier, I always go for premium because you have more features. If you just create an account, you can go for trial, and then create and review, and after a while we'll be able to create it. So I just click, once we have the information that the deployment is completed, go to resource, and then we click in the middle, launch workspace. When you will open Databricks for the first time, this is kind of the welcome screen you are going to get, where you can choose to start SQL Warehouse. We are going to do that later on as well. You can explore some sample projects or upload a data from your computer. This is not needed. Together with the workspace, we are going to have some sample data delivered by the Databricks, which we are what we are going to see. Instead, we will go to the menu on the left, to the top, this is the primary menu in the Databricks, like majority of the things you really do from that menu. And we go to the workspace. Workspace is a kind of our home folder where there will be in the future majority of the, our codes and our work located. We hit add button on the right and then we choose notebook, which is the primary way of interacting with the Databricks with the Spark cluster. First things first, let's call our notebook somehow. We can do it over here, like a first blood and what we see is that on the right we can choose a primary language we will be using to interact with the Databricks. The really cool thing is that you can change the language you are using later on in the same notebook. So at the beginning we just choose Python and that's it. Later on I will show you how to use SQL. We could start writing our code straight away but we forgot about one very important thing. In order for any code to be executed we need to have CPU power which is cluster. If we go to the menu on the left and compute, this is the place where we can create any cluster we want, any cluster we want, meaning from all they are available. And click create compute on the right or create compute in the middle. At the beginning, Databricks will suggest some sort of cluster for us. Let's look on it. This can be interesting. So what it's suggesting to us is to use important thing is with the workers. It suggests to us to use between two to eight workers, depends on the workload, and each worker, and the worker is a virtual machine, each worker suggested by the Databricks is 14 gigabytes of memory and four cores. We can change that, change that, let's say that we believe that we need something faster or stronger, and we can change the number of the workers. But what's very important is that whenever we change something here, it change also the price and the price is visible on the right side over here, 72 to 216 dBUs per hour. And what does it mean? We can, change on, we can check on the Azure page very easily. I just typed Azure Databricks DBU and this is the price per DBU. So we can see that in our case, it's 55 cent per DBU and we have pretty a lot of DBUs because we have chosen pretty pretty powerful cluster and to be frank I'm cheap cheap buster so I'm going to choose the cheapest what I can and moving from the top let me just change the name of the cluster I will call it C1 moving from the top I will use a single node because I'm the only person using the cluster then I'm going to leave the runtime I'm going to uncheck use Python acceleration and look on that, I already have the price of 0.75 dBU per hour, which is significantly different and that's what I like. The other thing which I can do is set the after termination. After termination is the information for the Databricks that if I will not use that cluster for, in this case, 30 minutes, Databricks will terminate it and I will not pay anything for the cluster. And after I configure it the way I want, I just click compute and wait a minute for the cluster to be created. Once our cluster will be created, we can go back to the workspace, navigate to our notebook, and on the right side, we see something that is called connect. If we click it, here is the list of the clusters available for us. In our case, there is only one, the one we have created a second ago. I will click it, choose it, 
and starting from now on, we can write and execute any code in the notebook on that cluster. As example, let me write simple code, 2 plus 2, and this code is being sent and executed on that, executed on that cluster. Pretty cool. The moment cluster was created, which was under preparation, I have prepared a very small notebook to show you how cool writing codes in the Databricks can be. At the beginning, I will show you this is a sample file prepared by the Databricks. There's plenty of such files. This one is good as any other about some information about the planes. I can very easily read the file using PySpark, meaning Spark in Python. It will, it will be enough to write Spark read some options saying that there is a header, CSV, and the path to the file. That's the content of the file. If we scroll down, there are data at the beginning, there are some nulls. But let's say that someone prefers to use SQL instead of Python, because someone doesn't know Python, he's coming from the data works or database world. It will be enough to use the same code, just at the end, add the option, write, save as a table. And starting from now on, that file will be registered as a table under Databricks. It doesn't mean that the data has been moved from the file to the table. It means that there are metadata registered by Databricks about that file, which are enough to allow user query the file with the SQL. This is really cool. And as the example, that's the simplest SQL code you can come up with. At the beginning, we are writing percent SQL, just to let know Databricks that starting from now, we will use SQL. Select star from planes. Planes is the name of the table under which we have registered that file, which is exactly like this. And that's the data. It's exactly the same results of like querying that data with Python. We can do, we can go and do more. We can group by or whatever else we would like to. This is simple group by by manufacturer and with some simple count, that's the results. And moving forward using SQL, it's not everything what you can. You can straight away go and create like plus visualization about the data you have in front of you. You have multiple different charts available. We will go with the bar chart, the simplest, as the column X manufacturer, as the column Y, we will go and ch choose a number just to show you the example, click save. And how cool is that? It's not that always I need to have a Power BI and spend hours to prepare visualization. Very frequently, I need to have good looking fast chart, which I just want to copy and send to someone over an email. And this is what I can do in Databricks direct directly without any Power BI, Looker Studio or any other tool. But that's not everything. Let's say that someone say, no, I don't like the notebooks. I'm coming from the data warehouse, databases. It looks differently. That is why you have, you have available for you something that is called SQL Warehouse to give you that familiar look and feel which you will get in the BigQuery in the or in the snow, Snowflake. I have already one warehouse created. I can create another one. Very simple. Just choose a size. Again, the cheapest, cheaper, better. And then serverless, that's the fastest, automate, auto terminate after 10 minutes in activity. I hit create uh, and I need name, hit create. And then I can go on the, on the left to SQL editor where, try it now, some new charts proposal, sure, why not? Where I can write any query I want. I can write exactly the same query which I was writing in the notebook. Let me just copy that query. So that was the SQL query we were writing in the notebook, I can go and run exactly the same query in the interface, which is very, looks very similar to what you will get in the BigQuery or Snowflake or all those other data warehouses solutions. Choose just change the warehouse to the one I have created. And that's the same results. It's crazy. You can use the way Databricks the way you want to. On the left, you can choose a tables. In our case, there is only one in the default database, which is called planes. That's the one we have created. There are also some sample tables created by the prepared by the Databricks. But overall, you know, everything what you need. You can schedule your query over here if you want to run it up once per whatever, every day or, or anything else. You can set up some alerts that if query will result, uh, will result in some value, it will send you emails. Everything you need. Moving forward, there are other cool things which you will not get in the BigQuery. You can you have a workflow when you can set up a jobs, meaning you can create some pipelines with different fancy dependencies and different fancy tasks. You can schedule some Python scripts or Scala, JAR, whatever you want, or something really cool and interesting, workspaces. And this is actually since, uh, since a few months where you can browser 
and you have available hundreds if not thousands different APIs from different companies so it's like a marketplace for data from where you can easily and fast get different interesting information if you want to learn more about the Databricks capabilities one of the good way the best way to subscribe this channel but another good way is to go and check DB demos which are like uh, tutorials like uh, examples prepared by uh, Databricks on what can you do uh, split it into categories data engineering of course some streaming data science and so on in the data science you can see you will have a cool examples where they are using dolly dolly is an llm based on alpaca to create a chatbot so it's really cool like they are building their own chat gpt with the with the difference that whenever you send something to chat gpt you don't have a control over a data and when you use a dolly from databricks you have this control so so it's really really cool Overall, I need to say that I'm using different solutions for many years, but whenever I'm logging into the Databricks, my face is smiling. In summary, Databricks is a supercharged big data platform which allows you to analyze massive set of the data in the cost-efficient way. It also delivers a unified interface for the data scientists, data engineers, business analysts and more, making their life way easier, and that's altogether part of the reason why Databricks is so popular. Let me know in the comment section what do you think about it. Meantime, don't forget to subscribe because there is a lot of new cool content coming shortly.